for which thank you very much indeed. Um, needless to say, I've got lots of questions, but going back, um, Sir so John was looking actually at the, more at the systems level, how it can work, how it can be made to work better, how we can be safer through um, being terribly clever. Um, Adrian, um, I won't say he was the eternal pessimist, but I think he set the scene for us in a very realistic sort of fashion. Realist. That <laughs> basically, be afraid, be very afraid. And um, Michael has suggested we rush out and claim for everything in our home insurance, and hope that they won't, as usually happens, find a loophole which I'm sure will follow the liability extremely quickly. Um, right, so this is your chance, folk. Um, <coughs> oh, I knew it would be Jeff, our very own Gresham Society. Um, <laughs> Stroppy character. Jeff, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> um, the, as we seem to have uh, developed better and better secure systems, although there's still cyber attacks taking place, does it occur to anyone that uh, it's becoming more of a challenge? And uh, boys especially enjoy challenges. And looking at Michael's list of cyber attacks this year, Eight out of, I think you had 12 there, were in June and July, just as a, um, in between, <laughs> just in holiday time for university students. Uh, <laughs> just one moment. <laughs> and uh, do, we, do we have uh, any figures for the sort of proportion of uh, um, hacking as compared to the serious mm. cyber attacks? Yeah, that's a good question. Sounds like a police so question to me. I mean, we, we don't have good figures um, that you could use for analysis and research. And this is the part of the problem. Um, agencies like GCHQ have a mission. It's not to perverse it. As though you might read the paper, you think they've got this great big fish in there and they just look at everything in the world. They have a, a government mission to look at certain threats, terrorist threats, th threats to our country. So they're not looking to see how many attacks are taking place in the world. So all you and I know is what we read in newspapers where those people who have been attacked have made public their attack. So we are really struggling with underlying data um, uh, as how many attacks, who's behind them. And I'm sure Michael will touch on insurance is a big issue. If you link insurance with motivation, how would you ever prove who actually attacked you and why? particularly where in a foreign state might leave a telltale that made it look like a Russian organised crime game. Yes. Sorry, Jeff. No, no, one question, sir. That's fair. <laughs> Couple over here. Um, Dr. Bowen, other well-known stroppy personality. <laughs> um, just wanted to... Several of you have emphasised, quite rightly, the international and the global nature and the lack of sort of agreed standards or protocols and so on. And this is therefore not a political question, um, but presumably membership of an organisation like the European Union helps or hinders, I would have thought helps, us to, to move towards securing that kind of um, international protection and standards. Um, and I, I just want, would be interested to hear your, your, your comments on that, because I know there's a lot of talk about sort of cyber security within the EU and, and you know, the, the developments in that sort of area. Uh, I'll just, in case Michael or John want to come back, but very briefly, absolutely. Uh, so the, we are enhanced by being part of Europe. There's a European cyber centre. Many of the standards we adopt are European, although often the, they sometimes follow a US lead. So absolutely right. But more powerful in space are businesses not governments. You know, international banks and international business and international service providers are the power base for this. Well, 100% agree with that. Um, and, and I think those sort of capabilities and the pooling and so on that goes on in, in those is, is undoubtedly valuable. But as we said, the network itself doesn't recognise that boundary. I mean, there isn't, a, a, that I'm aware of, a, a kind of map of Europe in cyberspace that says certain things happen in here and don't reach. Um, you know, so I think you have to recognise that, that if you look at it in terms of threats, it will come from anywhere. Uh, if you think in terms of school terms, 
I'll just go there. It doesn't apply in all parts of the world. I mean, it's a bit cold here, so we tend to use uh, July and, and, and August for our summer holidays, but elsewhere it might be a bit different, and so on. So I, I think that global dimension cannot be ignored. Yes. I think there's an interesting thing that Jeff's point is um, actually fairly serious because yeah. that was my three-year-old grandson on the That's phone. Um, and um, the speed with which he's actually learning how to use anything that plugs in is really quite terrifying. Sure. Um, and actually, yes, Jeff, a serious point. The, um, was it talk, talk with this 15-year-old in Belfast in his bedroom at home, um, you know, holding a major t telephone company to ransom? Um, the very young seem to have the kind of capacity which the older ones sort of have rather given up on. And um, yes, more and more university courses are actually being launched in cyber training. And of course, a certain amount of that inevitably will go to the bad. Um, at the same time, um, the question that Nick raised about there being you know, frontiers in cyberspace. Uh, if you can have an international community which buys in, mm. because there are obvious benefits to mm. everybody, every single country in the world can be attacked or hacked, can you then organise some kind of structure whereby, by belonging to a particular club, you can create sanctions to make sure that the countries inside those clubs, for example, cooperate over locating and identifying cyber criminals or whatever? Or is that just not realistic in the kind of world that we're moving in now? Adrian, perhaps, is a secure... Well, Adrian is a, is a police rather than Sir John is a technical yeah. one. Um, there's a couple of points that went through my mind. Just on the Times, it's interesting, actually, if you look at Times, it does give you an indication about countries. Uh, people are awake in certain times and sleep mm. at others. So if mm. you look at time, attack methodology, you'll see generally where countries... But it can be bound through different bodies and different servers, so it's confusing. The... What I'd love to get to is when we start stimulating, not through government, but the enhancements of security, the way you've just suggested, yeah. Tim, actually, in a way that you get an additional reward or benefit or enhancement. Mm. So actually the positive of cyber security mm. becomes the enabler, becomes the attraction. Mm. I want to be part of this because I get something from it. Mm. And that becomes so powerful that it starts to exclude the minority. That would be a very good way of... You know, getting through, businesses can do it, people yeah. want it, so they'll follow what the people want, and it doesn't involve <laughs> governments. Yes. Yes. It's us, the market, mm. does it? Yes. Well, a slightly different response, if, if, if I might. I, mean, I, I think what's, what's just been said is, is powerful. Uh, the comment you made about business is, is also important, because big businesses are global, you know, so they are yes. everywhere, and you need to recognise that. I'm going to say something about time frame, actually. I am, of course, of a very great age, so I can remember a long way back. You'll understand that. Um, how we used to do standards, just telecommunication standards, mm. years ago, was something called the CCITT, which, of course, would be in French. You would propose a standard. We would then, at, at some plea, we would then come back four years later. <laughs> at a certain stage, this would then end up in the coloured books, which are published every four years. Just think about the pace of change today. Yeah? But really, within my working life, that is how technical standards in communications were done. And just look at the rate at which things evolve, change, on. It's much more dynamic, it's much more free flow, and, and so on. And I think that's a, a real challenge to, to address when, when you say, what are the technical speed. implications of this? The speed. Yeah. Well, merely, I think the, the evolution in this space may or may not come from governments. I, I certainly would agree yeah. that being in the EU is a good thing for this. Being in all international yeah. fora for this is a good thing and standards. But I, I could see a couple of other interesting avenues. The shipping industry has relatively recently woken up to cyber because people have begun to work out that there could be some serious things that could happen to ships. And to be honest, 20 years ago, that would have been scaremongering when we were talking about Y2K, but now that's actually real. The, the ships are themselves there, so that's an industry that's moving. Another thing we haven't spoken about is product liability. We're, you know, we're moving from research uh, to, this is in that same 40 years, we've moved from what was research uh, to deployment. We expect these darn things to work. Um, you know, I certainly have one daughter, not the one that's here tonight, the other one. Who, who was panicky because her Google phone wasn't able to give her a map and she had no other way of, of getting out of a tube station and finding where, where she needed to go. Um, there's a lovely program, I, I do commend it so far, three, three episodes in, it's called Deutschland 83. 
um, if any of you have seen it. And last night's episode, um, the East Germans were absolutely flummoxed because they were, they'd encountered a new thing called a floppy disk, 1983, <laughs> you know. So it's moving at a rate of knots. And onto this, we're piling all this stuff, but we haven't put the product liability. We never, we never really think we should go yeah. back and, uh, and charge anybody with it. And that could happen, actually, in a U.S. court, the same way yeah. asbestosis took down Lloyd's. You know, yeah, everything was going fine until the U.S. court said, actually, we've been thinking about it. We interpret it slightly differently. You know, I've, I've often said at conferences where I have to listen to, and I'll be frank, Microsoft people, I'm like, I don't understand. Most of the things we talk about, 80, 90% of them seem to be Microsoft generated. And nobody talks about yeah. all the Linux people driving the internet, frankly, quite well for the, for, for the bulk of it, and they don't take any money from it. So there's a lot that says, if you're going to take the money, this is my indemnity point, you're going to take the money, that's great, but that's a product. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't feel I have any recourse to Linux and SendMail and all the server stuff that goes on there because they gave it to me for free. But these people are charging me, so why aren't they providing me with a, with a quality product? And any of those avenues could break open um, some of this internationally, whether, as well as, I agree with you, financial services and banking, which is a global industry, but other global industries, some government stuff, and law courts. Sorry, Michael, Y2K is what? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, too, too much. In. That was the end of the world. <coughs> that was the end of the world, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Y2K was the millennium bug. So. Ah, of course, yes. So, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And it's, it's, it's interesting because the funny oh, bit... Well, I, well, I was, I was a strip, yeah, no, no. strip of a lad in those days. Yeah. So I Kids these days. Actually, it's um, I ran something uh, with some other people. We set up with the Ministry of Defense and uh, the C C CSSA, which was then the Trade Association for the IT industry. And we set it up for financial services. We started in 95, set it up in 96, and pretty much had disbanded it uh, late 98. There was actually a real problem, but the problem was not planes falling out of skies or people getting trapped in lifts. It was the, that mortgages and pensions really did have material miscalculations. Yeah. But when you went and spoke to people in 96, they said, oh, yeah, that is a bit of a problem. And they invested and changed their systems and worked it out. Um, so it was, a, it, it was real. Unfortunately, the government then stepped in in 98 with mm -hmm. Action 2000 and somehow managed to disperse, I think it was 85 million um, on, on sort of what I would consider fake awareness that, ooh, it's all scary, but there's nothing you can do about it. But remember, we told you so. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Richard, I never um, fully understood that. Could I bring Alex and then you, so Alex, if I might? Probably noisy enough to go with that. Let's throw a pan grenade in. Um, as a lawyer working for a US law firm, you can guarantee if we could sue on it, we would. Um, but in the last 10 years, I haven't seen anything in the civil arena where a single company, not one, has sued because of a cyber attack. Now, we make money when money changes hands, and I can tell you in cyberspace it ain't changing hands. And if you look at TalkTalk Talk, and you look at the banks, other than when money is stolen, the criminal law, actually, I can't think of a single event over the last 10 years where a, an individual, and you can guarantee that if a company thought it had been attacked and lost money, lost goods, lost services, it would sue. That's sort of part, part one of the observations, three parts of this were observation. The second part is you can't, it is a personal observation, is as technology changes, I keep getting the impression, and I've said this probably now 20 times, you can't keep building the walls higher. Logically, the guys who are building the walls are going to get better paid by the villains for taking them down than they're getting a take for building them. And the third point, which keeps coming up, not here but everywhere, is, well, we should, there should be a law about it. And we mix up civil law, and we mix up private international law and public international law. There's a big difference between interstate law, where you're chasing state-sponsored crime, and private law, where I'm a major corporation, I've had my website taken down, I know where it's coming from, and I have no way of suing on it. And even if I did, the problem is the guy, the 15-year-old, don't have the money to pay me anyway. So observation. Do we, fit, do we build the walls higher, or do we change the paradigm? Ah, Michael, that's a commercial question. Over to you first. Oh, I, I, I think I... I think, I, think I, can, I can completely agree with it, that we've got to change the paradigm, um, without question. 
we've, this is the whole bit between having a, you know, another example at the moment would be something like hoverboards where you know, people have put these hoverboards out and everybody leapt on them quite gaily. And I, was it was something I saw, so like 15,000 out of 19,000 hoverboards that were inspected were defective and dangerous and about to blow up. So the vast majority, but people accept those sorts of risks at an early stage. I, I think we're going to see this coming. I mean, it, it, it's without doubt. Um, going to happen. It'll probably be a class action lawsuit, probably out of America, um, on, on something that people have got, you know, quite, quite tight. It's got his next holiday booked in Las Vegas. Well, that's probably it. But, you know, I mean, in this country, we've, we've got people who've, uh, who've lost out on many things due to banks and can't organize a class action lawsuit, but the American area seems to be the place to do it, and that'll probably happen. And then the good thing on this is, back to your question about international, a large chunk of that entire IT delivery community is in America. So they'll clean their act up globally because they have to clean it up for America. Yeah. Of course, the um, question about building the walls higher in the context of the recent flooding. Um, I, was in the, <laughs> uh, I was in the North Sea floods as a very, very small child, like extremely small. I was on my father's shoulders when we were getting away from the flooding. Um, the sea wall in 1953 was three feet high. They built it up eventually to 16 feet high, and the sea couldn't get over it. So what the sea did was to go under it. Mm -hmm. Very simple. <laughs> so they then had to build um, kind of stepping about 20 feet out to sea to break the waves up before they got to the wall, whereupon the sea took away all the shingle. And in the 90s, they were actually shipping shingle from the Isle of Wight round to the North Kent coast and sort of feeding it back on again because of the speed of erosion. So just thinking of that as an analogy, um, no sooner do you think of one solution to the last disaster than there will be a solution which will give you another disaster. Yeah. Perhaps go back to Adrian's pessimistic view of the world, I don't know. But the fact that it is fast moving, and there, there are actually no specific barriers, things can change. And this is back to the Rumsfeld um, conundrum, whereby you don't know what it is that you mm. don't have. Yeah. No. So there's a question at the back then? Yes. yes. Oh. Uh, so, the gentleman behind you, if I may. You got there first. Plenty of time, Chester, don't worry. Hi there. <clears throat> um, one part of the, of the potential solution is um, digital identity. People actually mm. somehow um, describing themselves accurately in a, in a cyber environment. Um, I'm just wondering if the panel members have any uh, thoughts or commentary around that aspect of uh, cybersecurity. I think it's certainly an area where there's room for improvement and there is some work. Um, I'm not sure that we should differentiate, I think, between when the person is there and when they're not. So some of the techniques that we will use when you present yourself going into a country will work extremely well. Some of the, uh, the biometrics and so on will play their part. Um, if, of course, this person is remote online, then they might still play a part, but not on their own. And I, I, I think, you know, with, with no particular insights other than the way it feels to me, it will be more a collection of things which work together to give greater confidence. I don't say certainty, but more things working together. And that's one of the approaches to getting rid of passwords, is a collection of things which work together, which give, give the identity. So I, I think it's, a, it's an area of work. We're not there, but I think it's got some... Some miles to. I think if we have enough um, support and energy behind, and this is where I go back to a government level, we can think um, about innovative approaches. We've done that in many other crime types. Uh, the one that immediately springs to mind with all things to do with cyber is the fact that we seem to have allowed email addresses to become an identity. Mm. So it mm. follows your point. But why have we not created any sort of international standards on the allocation of email addresses mm -hmm. or verification behind them or mm -hmm. something? Now, I'm not speaking in an area I know too much about, but there must be many things we can do that would include biometrics, that would include you know, how you exchange information. There must be other things that would allow us to do more to make our lives secure on the internet. Um, but I don't see a collective will by governments to solve those problems. I don't see this sitting across cabinet office being discussed or at any global conferences that governments think we must solve something here. And without that sort of government energy behind it, I think we'll struggle. Michael, what would you suggest? Yeah, well, I, you, you heard me praise the Estonian identity system mm. as, a, as, as something worth examining. 
uh, particularly as we, it was about 10 years ago, uh, we had our debacle here with our idiotic national identity card. Uh, it actually requires a mentality change. Um, the difficulty I find in a lot of the identity spaces, and, and it plays, I think, to your point, uh, is two things. It's about probability of continuity and proof of purpose. What do I mean by that? Well, no system has turned out to be right. And I've tested a few of them, facial imagery recognition, fingerprint vein recognition, not, not yeah, just yeah. the fingerprints, et cetera. I love uh, hearing the stories about uh, when you get it, all these things look great in the lab. The minute they got in the field, they've never really worked. They produce high false positive rates, and they really don't work it the way that you do. I know the BBC wants you to believe that British technology will give you 99.9999% recognition. Well, that's great, but unfortunately, it doesn't happen. In fact, one of the worst bits I ever heard was, uh, was interestingly, uh, Middle Eastern women from, Bangl uh, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, they are a nightmare. Uh, firstly, um, they all have very similar brown eyes. Um, secondly, they're obviously covered in many cases. And thirdly, they wash with the most ferocious soap, so their fingerprints are, are almost impossible to, uh, to read. And, and in fact, in many of the communities, the DNA sequences are not unique enough for rapid testing. So it's a, it, there's some real communities out there that are difficult. Identity is really complicated, and people try and treat it as, I know what the answer is. I need to hook a physical being to an email. It's not that. I, there's email addresses I might want to use for other very legitimate purposes. I'd like to see things online. I'd like to be quiet. I can be in an oppressed country. I don't really want to, people to do things like that. We had enough problems with a, an interesting thing, which is to have one of the UK extensions be designated against company's house, which I happen to think was a good idea. In other words, you could only keep that dot, you know, I forget what it was, it's like dot UK dot co or something, but you could only keep that extension if you had a company's house submission. Mm. Sounds very sensible, but companies have got all sorts of legitimate reasons uh, for not filing accounts on time, and you shouldn't re remove them from that. How strict is that, et cetera. So whatever you look at identity is there. So I, I tend to find, one, it is a probabilistic thing. You'll never be 100% right, and most government systems don't start out with that thought in mind. Um, and the second thing mentality-wise is this proof of intent. And intent is really important. You know, your, your aging grandmother, um, just before she gets dementia, you know, well, well, hang on a minute, she agreed to all of this stuff, but that was a year ago, and now the dementia is setting in. So what, what was her intention at, at that time? And the plethora of this then turns up in things like Sir John's uh, password malarkey, which is we've all got zillions of passwords because people know that that's what identity is about. So it's clearly none of these things are quite working. I think we need some deep thinking about identity. If I was to say another symposium, that would be yeah. on identity yeah. <laughs> or digital identity. That's our next, next but one. Um, of course, Sir John did report on the theft of fingerprints yep. um, in the States, so your yeah. fingerprint isn't necessarily... Uh, um, secure. Um, Jeff was talking to me in the break about whether um, you could actually belong to something which could verify you. Could you have a kind of a two half, where the two halves have to actually fit in together, whereby you have some, you know, looking mm. at some of the codes that you had, mm. where you have a unique code which can be verified by perhaps company's house or a government organisation. So your password is actually, or your identity, your unique identity code, whatever, is then confirmed by someone who you can reasonably rely on. Is such a thing for you? Well, I mean, the public key cryptography uh, yeah. system that I, I mentioned, which is very widely used, we all use it, although we're not aware of it, um, actually does provide authentication in that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so something exists. Yeah. Is it perfect? No. Uh, are we better off with it than without it? Absolutely, and so on. Yeah. It's, 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 that, yeah. it's that growing confidence that, that's really important. Uh, you, you used the word evolution earlier on, at, at certain stages you said it's evolving, and it, it triggered something with me. In this area, it's absolutely true things are evolving, but they're evolving in internet time. And that's the challenge. Can, can the humans keep up with speed? Well, I, I, I made this uh, very, very simple and obvious observation. The, the pace at which technology is involved has greatly increased our <coughs> ability to protect things in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, at the same time, it's greatly increased the ability of people to break that protection. You know, it's the two-edged sword. And that, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. So, to the, you know, should we continue to pursue these things in technology? Absolutely, we must, for the very reason that the alternative you know, will, will simply take over. So, whether it's building the walls higher, it doesn't mean that you don't stop uh, progressing the... Mm -hmm. yes. um, 
question there, Richard. Sorry, sir. This one here, then you, and then you, sir. Uh, oh, okay. Is that reverse order then? It seems to me that there is a role for government in all this, uh, which is to prescribe minimum standards mm -hmm. for certain aspects of hardware and software, because the weakest chain in any security system is always the human factor. Mm -hmm. um, we saw slides about spear phishing. I doubt whether there are many users in this room who will know when an email comes through to them whether they are running technology which will enable SQL injection, mm. whether they are running ActiveX, whether they are running Java, yeah. what the configuration settings are on their browser, all the sorts of things which will enable the bad guys to, to drop malware. There's a very poor level of public awareness. Uh, and I do agree with the speakers who say, there has to be far more public awareness. I can go to my local library and enroll on a free computer course that tells me this is a mouse, this is how you save a Word document, uh, this is the on-off switch, but on security essentials, on, on the next level up that actually enable people to be security aware, and I don't just mean you know choosing a sensible password, but actually understanding some of the technologies in a non non techy sort of way at the level that the user needs to know, in terms of being able to manage the risks effectively, there is nothing, absolutely nothing. If I go to a restaurant, I have a reasonable expectation I'm not going to get food poisoning, firstly because the restaurant operates in a market and has to protect its, re its reputation, and secondly, because I have a local environmental health department that goes around inspecting the restaurant uh, to make sure that I don't get a virus or a bacterium. But when I use a public computer in an internet cafe or, or a public library, nobody has inspected that establishment. Nobody knows if there's malware installed on the machines. Nobody knows if it's part of a botnet. Some, some of the places, I've been to a place, uh, one place, where I did a netstat command on it and it was connected to uh, 2,000 different IPs. Uh, and half a dozen of the connections were open to places in Turkey and China. Right. Sorry, sir, what is your question? So my question is, what is the role of government in all this? Is there a role for trading standards departments? Is there a role for minimum standards so that, for example, Microsoft can't enable ActiveX by default when it, when it sells a computer to a new buyer. What are the minimum standards that should be being prescribed and how will we get there? Michael, I think you wanted to come straight in. Well, it, it, just uh, f firstly, a declaration of interest. I sit on the board for many years of the United Kingdom Accreditation Service. We are sort of the standards regulator for all the ISO standards. Um, that, that's what we do. Um, and. I think one of the things that Sir John alluded to, and is quite right, standards progress slowly because if you progress too rapidly, you, you curtail innovation. Mm -hmm. But we're clearly getting to the point where those standards are emerging and they are coming out. Um, and in my, my glorious sort of 13-part slide, there is a, one, one of those boxes is very much about standards and the importance of them. Um, I would equally add, I think, that you need voluntary standards markets. It's not the standard, it's the auditing of it. So you're quite right about environmental health and safety officers going around, which happen to be government. But there are many other areas where we have private organizations. But the key thing is that it's audited. The standard has to be audited or it's meaningless. In a lot of the communications area, the standard doesn't need to be audited because it can't work if it doesn't communicate. But in the areas that you're at, it's there. There is an interesting uh, thing going on, which uh, I think pulls together uh, identity, uh, new technology, which you haven't spoken about. What, what could brand new technologies do and I, I, identity of that? and this Bitcoin blockchain, um, we've built a system. I was in the FT last month for having built a system on mutual distributed ledgers uh, for know your customer and anti-money laundering purposes. And so this is a, basically a, an open ledger that's distributed using the public private key cryptography system, whereby you get a wallet with your keys and you can release those keys to people that you wish. The ledger itself is held around the world and replicated everywhere but nobody else can look at it if you haven't given them the key. Um, and we have proposed, and the Channel Islands actually have, have picked this up. Uh, the Channel Islands last June, Jersey issued a consultation document on standards for these mutual distributed ledgers 
uh, with identity being one of the major application areas. So governments are seeing this. It's interesting that it's coming out of regulatory competition. It's um, so, so these things are, are, are happening. Um, so it's, I, think it's, I think it's a fascinating area, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more in that space. Right. That um, is the last question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> partly my question relates to the, the previous question. We're taking a very contrary view. I mean, the Internet's been described as a wild west, the need for standards to be imposed. And the beauty of the Internet is that it is, it is unregulated. We mustn't forget that the origin of the Internet came out as sort of ARPANET in the States, which was designed to have a flexibility so that you couldn't bring it down if it was attacked by nu in nuclear war. The, 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 the flexibility was it wasn't a centralised network. It was, um, surely, uh, my, my question is, uh, I think it's really what uh, Michael was alluding to, obviously those commercial organisations which have assets at risk from this will clearly want to impose their own protocols, standards, protect themselves uh, directly in terms of who they do it. But my view is by saying government must do something, um, imposing central standards actually makes it far more at risk because it then gives something for, for, for the criminals who are far more adept at knowing how to do it, knowing what to attack. Whereas the flexibility of the unregulated world, I think it actually offers some security. I mean, I, I think there's a balance in all of this. I do think there are some minimum standards that we should, uh, that a government should be asking any organisation that holds data to adhere to, a minimum set of standards. I then think the majority of this will be driven by business. You know, it comes back to Michael's point. Insurance is, is actually a really good stimulant, but we've got to turn the, uh, the threat of standards into what's the commercial competitiveness of being more cyber secure. What makes me want to buy my services from this provider because they are more secure? What services can we offer that make business make money? You know, corporates out there use email hosting services. What that means is all emails, or not all corporates, right, but some of the good ones, emails coming to an organisation go first to a hosting service where it gets cleansed and sterile and we make sure there's nothing in it. Then it passes it to you, the client. Why aren't there businesses offering that to me now? Why can't I go and buy that? Um, you know, why haven't we developed this where businesses are finding the solutions to some of this? Not governments, mm. but commercial business because it's competitive to do this. That's the real solution for us. I think it'd be fast, it'd be timely, it doesn't rely on governments and it will follow the market. I'd, I'd agree wholeheartedly with that. I'd, I just want to be, I think I'm going to be slightly trite if you don't mind about standards. They're really, really important standards. That's why we have lots of them for each single thing, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And the way we then get international agreement in standards is we put a pool of them together and it's left, in telecoms for example, for the, nas for the individual nations to decide how they're going to implement that locally. That's what NICC does. It actually decides how we make sure that the telecom services in the UK interwork, and that's necessary because there's such a diversity in standards. So they are really important, but uh, yeah. uh, there are certain challenges. Michael, do you want to say I think when, you know, when we're looking at this, this area of standards, that um, it, it won't be sufficient. Um, it, it is necessary, but I, I think it's again, it's like all the things, if there's no money behind it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. The problem for businesses in cyber is that they are following conventions because they can't do cost-benefit analysis. Um, you come to me as a cyber expert and I say to you, you know, what's that work? Well, you know, this is uh, Baker Consultants and what, what do I do? Well, well, we'll make you okay, so what do I need to do? Spend 100,000 pounds, right? And then Adrian comes, I'm a retired police commissioner. Well, I, I just used Baker. Oh, that's well known there. Yeah, charlatans. Use us mm. at Temper. Okay, how much? 100,000 pounds. So then Sir John comes up. The NICC have a new service. How much is that? That's 100,000 pounds. I've now spent 300,000 pounds, and what have I got? I've got a lot of advice. Um, you know, the old Chinese thing, you know, one man with one watch, one watch at a time, a man with two watches, never sure. And, and, and no, none, of them, <laughs> none of them are actually saying to me, and by the way, if this event happens, we'll give you two million just because we showed you that we're there. 
And it's that indemnity that's missing. And that indemnity is also missing from standards. Yeah. So I've done your standard. What of it? Um, you know, uh, it's, it's no secret, but at UCAS, we're getting a lot of complaints about one of the standards up there, ISO 27000, which has been around for a while. It's a cybersecurity standard. One of the biggest problems with that has been people coming and saying, oh, I've done it all, but I don't, it doesn't seem to make me yeah, any safer. No, um, so the standard, in some way, the people who implemented the standard need to, need to provide an indemnity. If, this thing, if you do what we ask you to do and it doesn't work, here's what you get back. And that's what makes all the economics. Yeah. Can I just take your opinion yes. to say, you know, and in that context, if you're an organization, your people are part of it, is <laughs> what I was saying. And that's a real challenge. Yeah. You, can I just add the people bit? Over 70% of all the major frauds and cyber attacks have got a people element to yeah. them. Yeah. So that, you know, this, this not technology is hugely yeah. important. It could be inadvertent, it could be employees who are stealing data before they leave because they're moving on, or it could be deliberate. You know, so some examples I've seen is where you have people who are employed as cleaners and they're deliberately going into an organisation to put a key logger device onto something, they'll leave it there installed for two weeks and they'll come back and take it off again and it has all the information they need. So whatever standards you have or even technology, it's the people, which is why it's the people and the process and the culture of an organisation to make it secure. Right. Um, Gresham College being what it is, we have very little time left, Richard. One question here, one question there. Questions please, not observations, we don't have time for them. So. Right, really snappy. Firstly, Michael, there are, there are maps in every tube station you should tell your friend. <laughs> they don't need a phone. Um, yeah, going back to what you said uh, about um, uh, the um, uh, ISPs and them keeping records and so forth. Now, I regard it very much as my problem that I need to insure myself. It's like my house. I insure the house, then I try and make it look unattractive to burgle. You know, and so it's, I try and do the same thing with the internet. I use a VPN. Now, my ISP doesn't record anything I do except connect to my VPN. If, for those of you who don't know what that is, the encrypted signal goes out of my computer. It goes through the ISP to my VPN uh, provider, and they connect to a secure server somewhere. It could be anywhere in the world. The uh, point is that it makes my traffic much more secure. So um, surely that's what we, we should be encouraging people to do. Obviously, it means governments can't look at what I'm doing, uh, but that's make, it makes us as individuals far more secure, and, uh, and that is the role of the police, isn't it, is to make us secure. So, I mean, thoughts, you know, I'm throwing it out there. I mean, the, the, the VPN network is a very secure network. A lot of people are using that in other parts of the world, you know, where they would not be able to use the internet at all. So it's a good thing. Encryption yeah. is a good thing. You know, all these things that help protect you and I are good. Uh, I just wish they weren't, you know, I wish we had more endorsement about some common sets of those by the big countries of the world, encouraging all people to do certain things. I sort of see them lacking at the moment. Well, I'm going to pick up on what I said earlier. Actually, there's a real need for more awareness here, isn't there? I, really, in reality, you're, you're absolutely right. The lack of awareness, the casual way in which things are done, and I think there is, is, is a real opportunity for that. Michael? I to take your whole bit. I, I love asking questions on resilience about how do you go back to pen and paper. Yeah. And I've, over the last five or six years, I've seen no circumstances where that was ever possible. Um, the, the systems are just too complicated. So uh, my daughter, um, who, who was lost, you know, but she was going beyond the, the limit of what the tube map showed you, you see. And it's that, kind of, it, it's that, no, it's that kind of thing. You know, she can go around the local neighborhood, but she can't go half a mile. We, we just don't have the backups. Yeah. And I think that's why we're going to have a 9-11. And it may be an odd 9-11. It's, it may not be terrorist inspired. It may not actually result in that much damage, but it will be horrifically embarrassing when 21 million people in the UK or something can't do something because they can't go back to paper and at the same time they can't go ahead with the computers. That's when something will wake up. Yeah, interesting. Now, quick question for you. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about this Estonia thing mm -hmm. that you've talked about and how far it involves surrendering uh, some of your privacy um, in order to have such a system. Estonia is a relatively small country in a very vulnerable position, but it wouldn't presumably be impossible to, in, to, to treat Denmark or the Netherlands or eventually England in the same way, would it? Well, th this is where it gets interesting. So just to cast your mind back, I think it was 2008, or it was on my slide, this, the Estonians are attacked, attacked and they, they realize that they need to make their country invulnerable. And to do that, they decided to encrypt everything. 
and they encrypted it in such a way that it's all locally encrypted. So there is no central store to get hold of. There's no master set of keys that you can get in Estonia whatsoever. Um, they then made sure that all of their embassies, where possible, would act as backup sites. And so this has been distributed. This is the way that these mutual distributed ledgers work. Each ledger gets a copy of everything that's going on elsewhere. Um, and they're, they're, they're accreted and added it. But you can only open little bits of the ledger that you have the keys to. So it becomes your data. So when you go to the Estonian embassy, you present your documentation. They will put what, what you want onto the system then and there. And they then hand you the key. And if they haven't kept copies, and if you believe them that they don't have another copy of your key, then you are, it's your data. The system that we've built um, as a prototype, working prototype actually for PricewaterhouseCoopers works like that. And I think that was the big problem with the US national ID scheme. It never, it never came from the principle, this might be your data. Mm. It came from it's the government's data. It'll sit in a big pile and tell you what to yeah. do. I would far prefer my personal individual health data was on one of these distributed ledgers. And the key is mine. If mm. somebody wants all the health data in the country, they have to get the key from 65 million people. Uh, and that's their problem. At the moment, I've got an NHS with very little security, whizzing documents around via email with all of my personal details, um, et cetera. And I'm supposed to consider that better. Yeah, so, so this notion that it becomes your data, and that's where the technology is interesting. The technology looks as if, if again, we come back to the, this enormous vulnerability of public key, but then everything goes, it's, that's a real cyber catastrophe. But so long as that works, it's possible for you, you to control and own your own data, and you can walk around the world safely with it, it but if you give your key away, well, you know, that was your fault, not mine. No, I'm afraid we, we can't take more questions because we're actually running over time. Um, I'd just like to draw things to a close. A few points which have come through very, very clearly. Minimum standards and the needs for high levels of security. Um, the possibility of input from the private sector as well as possibly more than the state sector and particularly because of the question of risk. The speed of change electronically and in terms of what people expect, what people want. And the interesting thing with regard to evolution, this is pure Darwinism. As soon as you develop one thing, an equal and opposite force will emerge. Maybe not equal, maybe not opposite, but it will emerge there. And the key thing, which is perhaps the most encouraging and the most discouraging, is that the whole thing revolves around human ingenuity. And you've got the criminals with razor-sharp minds doing incredible things for good or bad, and you've got people counteracting that who are um, overtaking them all the time. And this is the classic in an arms race. It's the same with um, the animals on the Galapagos Islands, changing colour, changing islands, changing dark, whatever. And that actually seems to be a, a very clear driving force. Now, um, I would like to move on to thank our speakers today for some very, very useful in interesting insights and some wonderful PowerPoint material. I would like to thank the Gresham College staff for all of their input to today's organisation. I sponsors the Mercer's Company and the Corporation of the City of London. The only thing I would add before there's a massive round of applause is this is a symposium and the Greeks define this as a conversation over a glass of wine which will be available now in the Headmaster's study. I hope. <laughs> yes indeed. So thank you very much indeed gentlemen for your assistance and for your attendance to your excellent questions. Thank you.